Welcome back. Today we'll talk about um, OpenCL or uh, GP GPU programming in general. We'll try to uh, go through a bunch of little examples to kind of get a feel for what's going on on these uh, on th this kind of hardware. Before that, any questions on the homework? Who got started? Yeah. Um, because uh, there's no expertise, expertise in um, instruction for the reporter. That's right. Yeah, I have to add that. But basically, it's the it's the yeah. same idea as previously. Make a plot of the of the throughput uh, um, versus size. Uh, we are required to plot the operations. The uh, uh, I call the wise axis. I think it's million operations per second, and there may have been one with uh, number of elements processed per second as well. I'm not, I don't recall. I'll stick that in there. Um, okay. I'll, I'll put in specific instructions. I'll try to do it tonight. The last one. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that at least my on my laptop there is the last one the performance seems to change a lot between. Uh, oh. uh, so I don't know. Let's see. So performance changes a lot. How much? Mm, like sometimes I get, I don't know, uh, 10, 100. Between 10 and 100? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, and this is with the same binary? Yes. With nothing else running? Mm, not much. I mean, maybe I have the browser open, but. Yeah. yeah, I mean, sometimes you could have a, a a Bitcoin miner running and you don't know, and that can really affect your performance, right? Um, I would suggest running on the server. Uh, there, we don't have Bitcoin miners typically. We may at this point, uh, since you all have access and there's lots of cores, but uh, <laughs> hopefully not. Um, and besides, it's not worth it anymore. Uh, I think. Uh, if you're running it in native um, on your machine, I don't really see why there would be such problems, yeah. but it's hard to tell when there's lots of other processes. And on a, on a desktop machine, there's always like so many windows, at least on mine, there's so much going on, there's no way to tell what's happening. Uh, it's good for kind of developing, but when you want to get the performance uh, numbers up, probably run it on a server, a little more predictable. Another thing that happens on well, both on the server and on laptops is uh, power management. So the CPUs, they have lots of different power states. They can be in low, low frequency, low voltage sort of situation where uh, things don't happen very quickly. Um, it could take a little while. Like usually, the either I think it's the OS that's in charge. No, the OS decides a policy for the CPU saying, or if you're busy, you should increase your clock, clock frequency. Or you should always be at the max clock frequency, or like that. And the CPU tries to detect based on what it's been doing. Has it been running a lot of uh, no ops lately? Or has it been halted a lot lately? Then it, it might um, go to a lower power state. On a laptop, it'll be much more aggressive, especially when you're on battery power. Depends on your OS, but at least on a Mac, it'll be very aggressive with power management. Um, so that's something to watch out for. There's, um, I forget, there is a command line tool in Linux where you can set the policy that you want. Um, it's performance policy, something like that. Right. Um, you may have noticed that Ben is absent again. I um, don't know what to do about it. I don't think it's his fault. I hope he's okay. Um, tomorrow his office hours will probably have to be cancelled. So if you haven't heard anything, then uh, expect that they are cancelled tomorrow. I haven't heard from him for a week, so um, I might I might have office hours myself on tomorrow as well to kind of make up for it. I haven't checked my schedule. Okay. Um, anything else on the on the homework? 
Right. So the uh, I don't know if I put a hint in there, um, but the the general principle for for getting the the indexes out that was the hard part. Right. Most of this homework is pretty easy, but the the getting the index of the minimum that's a kind of a tricky piece, and uh, the, the principle is to have uh, one register that keeps the current sort of index of the group. Like we're, we're processing eight at a time, right? So you can have a sort of the offset of this group of eight in a register that has lots of the, those numbers in all the values. And then you have a bit mask that you've already computed with this compare. Uh, so now you can mask out the, those numbers for um, like the current index number. You can mask that out for those values that are the minimum at the moment. And with a bit of OR and some, a bit of AND, you can uh, sort of combine the previous set of lowest index values with the new little set of new lowest index values, combine the two, and, and have a, a new set of the lowest indexes. That's the, at least the general, general idea. And it's just a bunch of VP ANDs, VP ORs, and a uh, bit of this and that. I think all the instructions you need are, are listed in the homework description. OK, so we talked a bit about uh, open or GPU programming uh, last time. I, I forgot to mention one thing, uh, one sort of big conceptual thing. Um, I call it GPU programming, but this is not at all about graphics processing. Right? So uh, a GPU has sort of two ways two modes of operation. One is this very specific, I want to render a 3D scene, or I want to render something graphical onto the, onto the screen. Um, and that would be normal GPU programming. You'll, heard, you'll hear about um, vertices and vector shader, or shaders of the, this and that, bit mapping and bump mapping. And there's all sorts of like, graphical terms that, um, if that sounds interesting, you should take a special class on that. And I think Andy Johnson teaches a class on that and, um, once a year. Um, and then there's what we call GPGPU, right? general purpose graphics processing unit programming. Um, so in this case, we run normal code. Right? It used to be that these GPUs, all they had were these vertex shaders where you, um, like, it automatically multiplies this array with that array because that's what you need to make the picture. Right? And someone figured out, oh, I can use that to do general purpose computation. So they would compile a for loop into some weird set of these shader operations. And it would work, but it was kind of clunky. And then they got smart, like NVIDIA and AMD and Intel and maybe others um, realize that it's actually a pretty good idea to be able to access this extremely parallel machine. Um, so they started making the hardware more general purpose. And at the same time, there were two different um, programming APIs developed to, to do that, the, those being uh, CUDA, which is uh, NVIDIA specific, and OpenCL, which uh, supports everything. The two are extremely similar. It's just that. If you use CUDA, you can only run it on NVIDIA things. And you have better tools, it appears, like better profiling tools, better debugging tools. Lots of, if you're working in gaming industry, you, know, you get lots of uh, custom support from NVIDIA. Like they really want to help out your, your game developers so that everyone needs to buy an NVIDIA card for their big machine at home. Right? So um, apparently, you get really, everything's really nice that way. Um, and on the OpenCL side, it's open source. It's a little more clunky. It's sort of like Apple versus uh, Linux. Right? You can do more. It's much more general purpose. <coughs> it's more open. It's a kind of a pain in the ass. So um, that's, that's sort of the trade-off. Uh, Performance-wise, uh, it appears that uh, if you discount this professional support you might get from NVIDIA, they're the same. Like, 
you can get them to run the same speed. There's nothing special about these. Uh, but, but when you have a better profiler, it's easier to write fast code. <coughs> and and um, we'll see if we can do any profiling of, of OpenCL programs in, in later classes. Uh, there appears to be some tools, but there isn't, uh, there isn't that much. OK, so anyway, in this OpenCL, um, we, we talked briefly about this, um, let's see, put this model thing back. Right. Um, so the general idea behind this program design is it, it, you always have these operations that apply to a grid. It could be a one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional grid in, in most GPUs. Um, and so um, you get to run a function that knows, oh, I'm supposed to be working on which one of these grids. You run the si same uh, cell, oh, sorry, <coughs> you run the same code on all of these cells sort of in parallel. Or at least the programming model is apply this code to each one of these cells independently. Um, you can probably squeeze many programs sort of into this uh, into this paradigm. I have seen things like network acceleration, like you want to do handle lots of uh, TCP sockets at the same time. You're a web server and you want to run TCP a little faster. Well, you can run like 100,000 TCP flows at the same time through your GPU if you're really clever. <coughs> but it's less obvious doing it that way than uh, if you're processing a bunch of matrices and you want to um, make pictures or you want to um, compute something in the natural sciences domain and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, maybe another thing, oh, we should try this uh, string search. Could probably be done pretty well if you're clever. It's not entirely obvious. So in string, string search, you would take your entire book Right, and you would <coughs> call every character a cell, perhaps, and so now you can start uh, a search at every character at the same time, right? And you look for a, if you're looking for a four-character string, well, you start at every character and you compare uh, the next four characters to the value you want, and that's a sort of a way to implement a, uh, a string match in in a GPU. It looks, it sounds kind of stupid. It is kind of stupid, but this thing is stupid fast if you give it stupid programs. And so in the end, it might be pretty clever. Right. Um, <coughs> of course, a book is really short, so nobody cares. Like, if you're, if you're, a book is maybe hundreds of kilobytes, right, something like that. Um, and so searching through that doesn't take any time on a CPU, so who cares? But if you're searching through, say, the internet, you have the internet in, on your uh, disk array and your Google, and you want to look for a specific thing on there. Uh, now you have uh, you know, petabytes upon petabytes to go through. You apply 10,000 GPUs to the problem, and it really helps. Right? So there's, there's, uh, it's a question of scale. And if you're doing uh, any sort of DNA processing, there's also, also large uh, data sets there. Lots of large data sets out there. So it's a trade-off. In any case, um, this is the abstract uh, processing model. So we apply a kernel, this little bit of code, to one work item at a time. And there's something called a work group. You can do some coordination that is local within a work, work group. And you can also do coordination across the whole thing. The main kinds of coordination would be a barrier saying, OK, let us all first do this first part. And then we wait until we're all ready. And then we continue and do the next part. So one thing that's very common if you want to run something fast is we all collaborate to copy part of the matrix we want to work with to, a local, to local memory, and copy it all in. Every one of us copies one byte or one word or whatever. Uh, and then we wait until we're all done copying that one word. So now we've copied in a megabyte. Everyone did one operation. And then we do the next step where we process something across that whole array. 
that sort of thing is a sort of common paradigm for, for a high performance um, GPU stuff. If you need to worry about uh, memory bandwidth. Okay, so that's coordination. Uh, that's the barrier. That's the main um, sort of synchronization primitive. There's two kinds of barriers. You can say within a work a work group. So all of these uh, 256 pixels that are near near each other. Let's say eight by eight, if you want. That's uh, what we're well, here. We're showing a, a work group of 16. Um, they can coordinate in that way. So now we do 16 at a time. Sometimes that's handy, or sometimes you need to do it for the entire um, <coughs> problem. Right? So we can also say, oh, let's first complete this first, first uh, phase of our image processing, turn everything into grayscale. Right? And then once we've turned everything into grayscale, now we flip it around. Right? And so um, it would be natural then to make that two phases in the same uh, kernel, do the conversion one pixel at a time, have a global barrier, and then we do the, the flipping, which would be basically um, reading a value from some other uh, part of the image, one value at a, at a time. So you make it uh, extremely work par data parallel in the sense that in, in that case, we wouldn't have any loops at all. It would be one move, it would be a, bar a global barrier, and another move, and we're, we're done. Or maybe a comparison in, in there somewhere. Okay. Um, let's take a look at what this looks like in sort of in, on the hardware. Um, <coughs> so I was looking into this is the OpenCL model. It describes a relatively abstract way of running these parallel programs. Right? If you have a single core CPU, you can run this. It's okay. You just run one work item at a time. And it will eventually finish. Um, but it's, it's, so the, the, the description is meant for running in parallel. So I was looking at specifically at the CPU, so the GPU that we have on, on lines. I bought a GPU uh, this summer just to have something to play with, mostly for class. Um, it's a cheap thing. I think it was like a hundred bucks or something. I, um, but it's relatively relatively nice. So. Um, I think uh, it was called, I think it's good to make this concrete, so let's see, I think it was called NVIDIA, no, Quadra, Quadro K620. Um, okay, in fact, let's do the, the wiki here. All right, so NVIDIA, they make a ton of these cards. And then there's AMD that makes a ton of cards. And they're all different, right? There's new, new chips, and there's all sorts of different specifications, like how many chips are on there, and, and how much memory is on there, and so on. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, very good. Um, K620. OK, so this is the one we're working with. Let's see what, it, what we're talking about here. OK, this is good. So, the core clock frequency, I wish we could do this better, but okay, a gigahertz, right? Uh, actually, I, I guessed somewhere in the gigahertz range <laughs> last time, and pretty close. Um, so, there's a, um, every thread or every core runs at a, as, at a gigahertz, the memory uh, similar. And then, what was this? This is, okay, so there's two gigabytes of RAM on board. So, um, as we talked about last time, the, sort of the general interface for, for programming the GPU is copy data over to the GPU memory, apply a kernel, copy the results back. In, in newer um, versions of OpenCL, there is specifications for shared memory type programming. It's not supported by this GPU. It's supported by sort of half and half by NVIDIA, much better by Intel and and AMD because they put uh, GPU processing inside of the CPU. And then you can do uh, better things. We'll talk maybe a little more about that later. OK, so what do we have? Um, that's just about the memory. Bandwidth, OK, pretty good memory bandwidth, 29 gigab gigabytes per second. Um, 
<laughs> stereo connector, yeah. Um, and then CUDA cores. <coughs> this is really confusing because they kind of, you know, there's a lot of marketing involved here. And so I had a hard time actually determining what these things do. And it's kind of, it's still a little fuzzy. And I, it, I think it's, um, it's because in order to go fast, these things need to be very parallel within the core as well. So I'll try to give you a, a good overview of how it all fits together. But this 384 refers to how many of our work items can be executed at any given time. So we have an instruction running for a work item in the sense of an uh, execution unit in a, GP, in a CPU. Right. So the CPU is currently retiring this instruction. That's sort of what this means. So we have 384 instructions that can run at the same time. Not in the sense of, of, of out-of-order execution where they're sort of in flight, but in the sense of execution units. So whereas the the Xeons that we've been working with have maybe two adders in parallel, right? So we can do two. This thing does 384 adds at the same time. But then the, the Xeon has two load units, right? We have two of these execution units that can execute a load per cycle, but then it takes many cycles to do a load, right? It can take hundreds of cycles to do a load. And in fact, we can have uh, maybe 60 or so of these loads in flight at the same time on the, on the Xeon. Stores, that's the size of the store buffer, right? All of those stores are in flight. So in, in one sense, we can run one store per cycle. And in another sense, we are running at the same time, maybe 60 stores per cycle, right? So that's where it kind of gets a little confusing. Okay, well, so in any case, we have um, each one of these execution units can run at least one instruction per cycle, I think. Probably more like a couple. Depends on which instructions you want to you wanna use. Uh, but it's something like that. Okay, so let's see. So CUDA, not CUDA, NVIDIA, and this one is called... Uh, M107. Maxwell. Okay. All right. So there's 384 CUDA cores, and CUDA means all sorts of things to NVIDIA. It's it's like it's the programming tool set. It's one of these cores. It's the API. It's uh, it's like the whole ecosystem. So CUDA cores is, is sort of like x86, right? We just, like all of these things are x86, and all of these things are CUDA, maybe. Maybe more things are CUDA, really. All right, um, but there's more going on. It's divided into three um, streaming multiprocessors. Okay, so that means 128 each, right? <coughs> yeah. 128 cores per multiprocessor. And then <coughs> inside of a multiprocessor, they do divide this further into four chunks. And I don't know what they, those chunks are called. Four pieces of 32 each. Okay, so these 32 cores, they are this cohort that really run together. So if we look at this again, we can say our oh, work group consists of some arbitrary number of uh, work items. But in the hardware, they, they do 32 at a time. So one of these streaming multiprocessors will receive a work group. Uh, let's see, sorry, work group being this one. 
big box. And it'll see, okay, there's 256 things I need to do in here. I'm gonna take the first 32. I'll take the first 32. I'll schedule it onto one of these four pieces. All right. So now we're running 32 um, threads, more or less. 32 work items are being processed exactly at the same time. Very much in the, in the SIMD uh, scenario. So uh, uh, SIMD um, uh, context, like uh, we are running one instruction, we say add, and we have 32 different registers, all with different values, and we add them all together with whatever we said to add. Right? So um, one of these four pieces in executes one instruction and applies it to 32 different registers um, over and over. Right? So if they all need to execute the same instruction, then we can go really fast. We get to do 32 pieces of work <coughs> per time. If you have code that has lots of if conditions, or you're um, sort of branching out in different directions, then it could be that each of these 32 work items are doing individual different work, running different instructions. Really, it's different program counters, right? The, the address that we're, of the instruction we're running. They want to run a different address instruction. Well, um, then we're going to run one at a time. So this this piece here, <laughs> it's unfortunate because the, it, it used to be a nice, nice a single uh, streaming multiprocessor. But anyway, this piece here um, will will finish the set of work items as quickly as it can. Right? So it'll like it'll run a few instructions and then maybe one of them blocks waiting for memory, and it'll run a, some of the other work items if if the other ones are ready to run. But you could also imagine that we have 32 work items and they all need the same thing, right? They all want to just load something from the global memory and then add it to a local array and then load it from global, load something more, add it to the local array. So in that case, all of the um, cores, if you want to call them cores, we call them CUDA cores, so why not? Um, they will all block, right? We're all waiting to do that memory load. And this is normal DRAM. It's, yeah, I think every GPU card I've seen has that like the main memory bank is normal DRAM, like you, what would you would have in a, in a CPU, maybe one of them, sorry, on a motherboard. Uh, maybe one of the more expensive types, like it might be this GDDR5 instead of four or something, but um, generally speaking, mem normal memory, with lots of extra buses. We want to make this really fast, so they add lots and lots of buses, so the memory bandwidth is insane. Some of these things, uh, if we scroll down a little bit, let's see. Um, okay, so here, this is gigabyte, okay, megabytes, no, this is the wrong one, right, memory, memory bandwidth, gigabytes per second, right? So here we're, going 870 gigabytes per second. Right. It's <laughs> kind of ridiculous. On the best machine that we have, you can do 20, and that's awesome. Right. Um, so within this GPU memory, you can go really fast. But that's, that's bandwidth. What about latency? Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah, but what's a good, like, how long would it take to load something from, from GPU main memory? 100 cycles? Okay, not bad. Yeah, 100 cycles, 200 cycles, 300 cycles. Sort of like what you would <coughs> expect with a CPU. Right? It's the same technology. It's just a memory bus. The limitation is the DRAM itself. And so we're using the same memory. It'll take hundreds of cycles. So now we have these. We were working on 32 threads, and they suddenly want to load from global memory, and then we're taking a 200 cycle hit, right? With 32 of them just paused. In fact, it's worse than that, because we're running the same code. It's 
remember, we're running one kernel on all of our multiprocessors. So now you have 384 cores, and they run into a brick wall trying to load from this, from this uh, really slow memory. The bandwidth is awesome. So they're not going to be kind of um, congesting the buses. But they will still have to wait for 200 cycles. So what good is this? Well, the solution is to add more parallelism. And so that's what, um, much like on the, on the Intel machine, we try to hide the latency by adding more parallelism. But because the problem domain is so much more parallel here, it's much less complicated. On the Intel machine, you have to worry about like dependency between all these data things, and we try to run things out of order, and you know, because we have one thread, and we want to make it go fast. Um, in this case, we have so many threads. We have thousands of threads. We don't care. So we'll just block the thread. If there's anything that, that uh, we need to wait for, just make the thread wait. Whatever. Find a new thread, run that one. So it's almost like hyper-threading, right? With hyper-threading, we're saying, OK, I don't know what else to run now in this hardware thread. This other hardware thread actually can do something on my execution units while I wait for, for more data. And so um, on a GPU, not only do we do 384 hardware threads at the same time, or 384 cores, but on top of that, <coughs> you can run 64 hardware threads. Right? Each core can run 64 threads at the same time. Okay. So each can have 64 threads in flight. OK, what are we talking about here? 384 times 64. OK, so now we're talking 24,000 threads. How do we manage that? Well, one easy way is this is work group. And so we gave it 256 work items, let's say. We could only execute 32 on any one of these four chunks. OK, so now we're running 128, right? We have four chunks. So we run 32 on each one of those. Um, so within our single streaming multiprocessor, we're running 128 at the same time. But now they're all blocking. Well, we have 100, another 128 work items. So we'll just run those two. As soon as one work item blocks, start running another one of these, um, uh, let's see, Ch chunks of 32, which is not defined in the uh, OpenCL standard, but it's defined. It's called something in CUDA, which is nice. Um, a warp. You may have heard of this. A warp is okay. Thirty-two threads that run together. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this is a truth with some modification, right? They all don't always run, I and mean, it's either they run nothing. Or they run the same instruction. Right? If they if they kind of diverge, then they have to wait for each other. But that's the general idea. So a warp is this idea of 32 threads, 32 copies of a register where we're applying the same operation to. Okay, so we have this work group. We had we have four warps running at the same time. 128 threads. And then uh, one of the the uh, four, four pieces inside of our uh, streaming multiprocessor has a warp that's blocked. It can't do any more, make any more progress. Well, then we'll schedule another warp, right? another 32 threads. And that one gets blocked too. Schedule another warp. Right? How many do we need in order to make this program, like, in order to efficiently use our available memory bandwidth? It's it's going to be a relatively large number. So I think we can sort of figure it out. We have a, 
latency of a couple of hundred cycles. Um, we need to run something every one of these cycles. So say a load takes a, let's see. I don't have a good calculation, but um, say for every work item, we need a couple of cycles actually on the CPU. The remaining cycles, we're just waiting for, for uh, the, the memory to respond. So uh, if, it, if we have 200 cycles to go, every one takes, takes, say, every piece of work takes like five cycles, well, then we need to have 40 of these warps scheduled at the same time as well. Right? If, we have, if we can run 40 at the same time, then uh, we're never waiting for memory. Right? We always have something to do. And so that's actually what, um, what they're doing here, 64 threads in flight. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we can have 64. This essentially means 64 different warps are running on a, a given core at a time. Yeah. Yeah. So there's 64,000 registers like in, in one of these streaming multiprocessor, well, actually in each of these four pieces of the streaming multiprocessor, there's 65,000 registers. So it's not that we're storing this data away somewhere. Every one of these 64 has dedicated space uh, where their memory is at the moment. It's very much like hyperthreading, where there's, like, there's two REXs. Right? It looks like two cores to us, but it's really two REXs running on the same core. Here it's just that we do the same thing times 64, and then times uh, 32, right? Because it's for every instruction it's 32, and then we may be running 64 instructions at the same time uh, in some in some sense. Right? They're in flight at the same time. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, do you have context switching, or are you only ever switching when you have a blocking problem? Yeah. So it's it's basically uh, cost-free context switching in that. Uh, the GPU knows when the response will come in. And so we, we issue a, a move. And then when we're after that, we know this one isn't going to do anything for a while. So we go and run another instruction. And it's just switching between all these warps seamlessly. So there's no, no cost to that. Uh, just like in, in hyperthreading, <coughs> there's not really a cost to running an instruction from there and another instruction from there. Like Picking from both threads. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking, like, well, could it possibly take a while before you get back to the, the thread that you want to run or something? Because those things running for Yes, so if you worry about the performance of a single thread, then uh, you could imagine that if you just ran one, that you could get a, a quicker response because you're not waiting for the core. But in this case, we'd never care. If you care, care about the performance of a single thread, you should be running it on the CPU. Um, so now instead we run 100,000 threads, and they're all kind of fast, but not crazy fast, and everyone's happy. Um, OK, so uh, but I just described here that this work group, so the work group is sort of a, an abstraction, right? The, the programmer knows how to work with a work group. You say, OK, I'm interested in these blocks of pixels that are 8 by 8. I'm going to apply a filter to 8 by 8 blocks of pixels. So that's how I describe the work. But 8 by 8 isn't much. And that's only 64 uh, work items. So if you schedule one work group onto one of these streaming multiprocessors, you won't even like. You only run two warps in total. So we can't very well finish uh, two warps, whereas, whereas we could be running uh, uh, <coughs> 256. Right? So um, we can't very well wait for one work group to finish before we schedule the next work group onto the streaming multiprocessor. So there's one more step. Each streaming multiprocessor streaming multiprocessor we have 32 work groups in flight at the same time. So 
So this means something different. This is just a queue. Right? Otherwise, there would be too many here. Um, but basically, we have we know that oh, there's more work items sitting around in these work groups that need to be done. So if you're running out, if any one of our execution or if any warp finishes, we can pick a new warp from any one of these uh, um, work groups and and get some more work done. Okay, so that then ends up being, you know, if you want to fill this thing, oops, let's see. Uh, so it was 384 <coughs> times, so that's the number of processors on each 64 threads can be executing concurrently. Those have, they have their own registers, right? Um, and then on top of that, we have uh, within the streaming multiprocessor, we could have 32. Okay, so if you actually want to fill this thing, you should have 786,000 threads. Right? That's sort of when you give it the maximum parallelism. After that, there's no point. Well, maybe there's a point, but there's less point at that point. <laughs> okay, that's a lot of threads. These threads are really cheap, so that's okay. Um, okay, so naturally, there is not enough register states to hold 786,000 threads. Right? We don't know how many registers each thread needs. If it's a complicated calculation, maybe we have 10 local variables, 20 local variables. It's not going to necessarily fit. It all depends. So um, it's, it's up to the streaming multiprocessor to see, or oh, do I have enough register space to actually run another warp? All right. It's several different constraints at the same time. You need to have the, um, the space for one more of these. Right? There needs to be a warp available on, on your uh, execution units. And then you need to have register space. And maybe there are some other constraints about memory um, as well. There's local memory needed, perhaps, and, and so on. OK, so it's a pretty complicated thing. But I think the overall message is don't worry about making too many threads. There's really no cost to making threads here. So we should not have loops unless we really need loops for the computation. We should just make more threads. OK, um, let me see. Oh, uh, maybe before we move on, we should take a quick look at this too, right? We were running on here. Um, what's it called? K620. <coughs> this one. Right, so we have 384 of these threads. It was introduced in 2014. Right? That's why it's cheap. It was probably less than 100 bucks. Um, so if you buy one of the sort of high-end ones, you can expect more cores. Right? Uh, it looks like 5,000 is where we're at at the moment. It's a 2018 machine. Um, so 5,000, and this is also a newer. Uh, this is yet another family. There's one family in between here. I forgot the name of them. Pascal. Is, is P is Pascal. V. Volta, that's the most recent one. Yeah, so each one of those, generally speaking, allows more parallelism, right? So instead of 64 warps at the same time, you might have 256 warps. Um, and you have 5,000 of them instead of 384. So, you know, it just gets uh, wider. At some point, it, I think it gets kind of hard to, to write code that's that parallel, right? So if you're trying to render an image, you want sort of one, one thread per pixel, and then, the, then what? Like, how do you divide one pixel up into 500 threads? Right. That gets difficult. So um, at some point, probably the extra parallelism doesn't get you very far. That card is also 15 grand. Nice. <laughs> or more. 15 grand card, yeah, good. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, you need a lot of Bitcoin, that's right. <laughs> Fortunately, um, in, in the more recent, I don't think R supports it, but in more recent uh, hardware, there's also support for partitioning the GPU. So you can make it into multiple smaller GPUs that different programs <coughs> can run. Right, if you're playing a game, then you don't care. Like, give the whole GPU to the game, and that's that. But if you're, you've got on one screen, you have a movie playing, and another screen, you're, um, maybe you're compressing a video lecture, right? And then on another one, you're, you just have a web browser open. All of them needs a GPU. Rather than kind of time slicing it, you, you can slice it up so you, you get 500 cores. You get 500 cores, right? And then um, you can sort of run at the same time. Yeah. I sound like Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Right. Let's play with it. Um, so I have a, let me try to clean this up a little bit. Get rid of that. Do something simple first. Um, not even this. <coughs> okay. So <coughs> this is our kernel. It doesn't do very much. It has a glo a global ID. This is the basically your pixel <coughs> number, right? If you want to think of it in a, in a pixel sense, or it's, or in, it's, if it's a string. So the index into the string, because we have a, a core per, per character. Right? Um, or if it's a 3D sort of thing, it's the voxel ID. And then there's the local ID, and that's inside of a work group. This is more sort of defined by the program. So maybe it makes sense in our program to deal with 256 items at a time. Right? That's one work group. So now. If that's the, the case, then the local ID will be, be between 0 and 255, always. And we can probably get a group ID, too. Um, but let's ignore that for now. OK. Um, so this, this kernel here, uh, let me put all this junk like this. Um, let's do. This local, uh, this core, all it's doing <coughs> is writing to an, a result array. It's a big array, one element per, per thread or per uh, work item. We're just work, uh, writing out the ID. OK, and then there's sort of the driver code. And that, that's a little more involved. This is really simple. It's nice. Writing kernels is not very complicated. The driver stuff also isn't that complicated. The, you know, it's sort of a standard formula. General idea is do a bunch of initialization. Find the GPU, figure out, um, or find your program, like read in your program from a file, get it to get the runtime to compile the program. That's how it works in generally speaking, how you do it in OpenCL. You, you compile it at runtime. It's a little weird. The, the kernel is compiled at runtime. The normal code, this is just a C program, <laughs> nothing special, but if you give a runtime the .cl code, the .cl here, <coughs> OpenCL, uh, compute language, I think, stands for. Um, so you just tell it, here's the source code, and it'll compile it on the fly for you, which means you get compile errors at runtime. It's kind of funny. Um, and then, OK, so now we have our program. Now we have to tell it what to do. Everything you do is in a queue. So you first make a queue, and you say, do this, do this, do this. You can say the queue should be in order or out of order, um, depending on your constraints. In order is fine in this case. And then we copy some data over to work on. And then we execute a kernel. And then we copy the results back, and we're done. OK, so here. There's a little bit of more code hiding in here. Uh, right, create device is looking for a G 
for a GPU, this thing loads the program from a file. Right? It's not complicated, it's just kind of annoying. But it'll be the same every time. So you can kind of take this formula and apply it to your entire career of GPU programming. <laughs> OK. Um, in, in CUDA, it's not like that. Because everything is more specific, everything applies only to this one architecture, um, and because they maybe paid a little more attention to user friendliness, it's just a couple of lines, and you're off running a kernel. Uh, but then you have to use the CUDA toolset. You can't compile with GCC anymore. You have to compile with NVCC instead. And, and turns out these compilers kind of suck. Like the whatever comes with the, the driver is not nearly as nice as LVM or GCC in terms of optimizing the code. And I think we'll find out uh, along the way. <coughs> Unfortunately, hold on. Um, there's no such thing as looking at the assembly. It's, it's all very well hidden away. And, um, and so it's hard to kind of debug performance at that level. Yeah? Sorry. Um, so what you're saying is that the compiler is in the driver <coughs> and that the driver writer has to expose that to us. So uh, that's. So that's part of it. Well, it's maybe not in the. Yeah, it'll be in the driver, right? Because it'll be. OpenCL is standard for, for a whole family, at least. For like for all Intel things, all NVIDIA things have their own OpenCL library. Um, but then, uh, let's see. So here somewhere, build program, or maybe create kernel, one of those two. Probably build program. Um, let me see where we have it. Create program with source, right? So this is an OpenCL sort of thing. And because it compiles to the specific architecture of the GPU we want to run on right now, uh, it has pretty much has to be in the driver. Right? So is OpenCL then a layer on top of the driver that helps deal with OpenCL is the, sort of the interface, like the API, sort of like POSIX. Or, yeah. I got you. Um, okay. And then every manufacturer makes their own uh, set of, of tools for it. Uh, all right, so so we did all that. And then we copy. And what does this program do? This, I have a very si simple program that we're going to play with a little bit in the remaining uh, time. So we just allocate some memory. We don't put anything of any import at the moment in there. There's a um, shared single integer. Um, that's here, let me make it a little bigger. Uh, in fact, like that. OK, so here's our uh, device shared variable. Right? It's four, four bytes long. Um, and then we have this results thing. Right? And that's uh, one per client. And we've specified how many clients we want. It's uh, 65,536, right. 2 to the power of 16. OK. Um, <coughs> so every client has access to its own element in that array. And there's one global number. And that's about it. So we pass in. Um, oh, and an integer saying how many times you should do something. And, and we'll see. When we, maybe we'll use that for some, uh, for some steps. OK, finally, we have a workgroup size defined up here. Right now, it's 64. So we're dealing with 64 elements at a time. Um, and we just run this thing once. Right. So once we copy the values over to the GPU, we apply the kernel one time, and then we read what came out. And then finally, we print it. So uh, basically, we print whatever did the, this work item put in the, in the results array. So I'm going to use this to kind of get a feel for how this thing executes. OK, so our current program then, 64 work items in a group. And we're running, we're just outputting the ID of the, of the work item. This should be relatively predictable. 
But why don't we run it first and, and uh, <coughs> take a look? So oh, let me make sure. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so the output will look like this. So here it's saying, oh, work item this produced this value. All right. And because we told it to produce the ID, pretty straightforward. Okay, let's do something different. So now we have the local ID. And what would we expect? Anyone want to take a guess? What, what kind of values are we going to get? We have a work group of size 64. Zero to 63, exactly. All right, so let's do that. And this is funny now. This is a CL code. It says CL down there. So this is actually compile at runtime. So I changed it to LID. I don't have to recompile it. I, I, I'll just run it again. And there it is. In fact, let's try removing a semicolon just to see what happens. All right, so I'm trying to run it. and it. So this is a different compiler now. Uh, whatever is hiding inside of OpenCL is complaining. Supposedly, you can also pre-compile it with OpenCL, so you can have a statically compiled binary that's helpful if you're building a game engine or something and you don't want to reveal the whole source uh, to your customers. Okay, um, right. Okay, so in order to do this, to kind of get a, a better um, picture of it, we can do this. So I'm printing just the third column, and then maybe I sort them by number. Actually, let me just demonstrate how this looks. All right, so now they're sorted numerically, and then I do unique minus C, count how many of each. All right. Okay, so it looks like our entire work <coughs> is separated into 1,024 work groups, right? And e in one, each one such work group, there is an item with number zero, number one, number two, number three, and so on. Okay, I think, and here I'm also um, tracking how long does it take to execute this. So it took us 3,000 thousand cycles um, to, so three million cycles, right, to um, upload the data, the empty results array, uh, apply the kernel, get the data back not the printing or anything like that, and not the compiling and so on. So uh, about 3 million cycles. Um, let's see, what was it that we did? We initialized an array of 65,000 elements, all right, with numbers. So how long would that take on our CPU? Quarter of a second. Ooh, that's an interesting way to put it. Uh, I think that's probably too much. Uh, there's 65,000 elements. So I would think maybe 10 cycles per element, something like that. Right. So 650,000 cycles, that's uh, less. That's less than a millisecond. All right. We can do two million cycles or so in a, in a millisecond. Right. So here, it really didn't work out. Right. We're doing something down. Um, of course, if you're initializing an array, it doesn't help to first copy an array over to the GPU. And then, because that's copying the, the array, is actually touching every memory element. And then have the GPU something, and then come back and copy it again, is clearly going to be a lot slower. So. Um, that sort of thing, you probably want to use the, the CPU. If we're initializing it cleverly, it's different. OK, let's try something uh, a little different. So uh, let's do a count. All right. OK, so we have this shared value. Why don't we, why don't we say OK, I'm only Splitting it out like this uh, for didactic reasons, 
the moment. We'll see. Um, so basically, share here's a pointer. So I'm saying, okay, just increment whatever it's pointing at right, by one. What do you think? What are we going to get? The same performance, you mean? Yeah. What about the values? Now I'm not doing this local IDs anymore. We're just incrementing this shared global variable. Right. You're either going to get garbage or you're going to get, um, or it'll slow down because it'll all be waiting on each other. Yeah, garbage, I don't know. Yeah, we could get strange values. But remember, all of this is at least conceptually running in parallel. It's, a, it's an increment, so I guess they would all. So you could imagine them all, like this splits up into a load, an increment, and a store, right? So they're all <coughs> running the load, and then, and they're, they're all going to be running the load, right? Because that's a blocking thing. That's really slow. So all of these 65,000 th threads will run a load. And then they will run an increment together. And then we don't know which order they'll do the store. Right? Um, maybe they'll do an increment and a store, or they'll all do an increment and then a store. Probably um, a bit of a mix. But in any case, the results will probably be the same. Huh. <coughs> Look at that. So it looks like, you know, it could have been that these were all going to be zero, right? In principle, they're all executing at the same time. So they could all just get a zero that they're loading. And that's so value will be zero, plus, plus. Uh, increments it after, so the, the value would be zero. But then, well, there's no guarantees that they run at the same time. So it looks like here, some of them saw 15 increments, right? Some of them saw, saw zero increments. It's kind of a mix. So it kind of ran in 16 chunks, all of this, right? These. Uh, so we had, let's see, actually, if we do the math, maybe we'll get us something interesting. Uh, so, oh, <laughs> right, thank you. So in 16 chunks, 4,096 were ran running at the same time. Um, we had 384, uh, that was how many, um, threads we had. So it looks like, oh, they run about um, 10, 11 warps in parallel. Right? In order to fill the memory bus, they had to run 10 or 11 of these uh, load instructions at the same time. That's how we ended up with, um, with 15 different results. OK, let's try this instead. So now we're incrementing it, and then we're reading it. <coughs> so now, at least in principle, they all did the store. They could, in principle, have done the store together. And then they need to do a, a load, which will be another. Because it's a volatile, it'll actually be another load. And you have to, you have to get it from uh, memory. Actually, now I'm curious. So let's do a. Uh, barrier in here. Oh, I don't have to do that. Okay, so now if I understand this correctly, and I haven't tried this, I would think, because this is a global memory fence, all of our increments would happen at the same time before we read anything out. But they happen at the same time. So we're not going to get 65,000 increments. They're all going to kind of collide. We'll get some random number of increments. Maybe it's 16. But they should all have the same value, because they all wait for each other to finish. Now the, the values in global memory is stable. And then we read it. So they should all get the same value. Hmm. Oh, I forgot to do this. Right. 
Why is that? Okay, I'm gonna have to figure that one out uh, offline. Um, unless I did I save it? Yeah, it is saved. Let me run one more time. Yeah. That's really unfortunate. How can that be? Okay, let's try something else. So I'm gonna figure that one out. I'm really curious about that one. Um, it could be that I'm misunderstanding global, and it doesn't mean in the memory, it means within whatever's running on one of our streaming multiprocessors. Whereas the local is within one um, within one work group. So maybe that's it. OK, let's try another one. So uh, I wanted to look at this uh, local variables. So local memory is, according to the OpenCL spec, it looks like it should be uh, local to each work group. At least in the uh, NVIDIA imp implementation, it isn't quite like that. It's local to the streaming multiprocessor. So I think we had a picture of this somewhere. Um, huh. I've lost it. Uh, let's see, maybe. Yeah, I've lost it. Anyway, um, so this is local memory. There's some some uh, megabyte or so of local memory that's available to each streaming multiprocessor where you can allocate faster things. So let's um, just see how that behaves. So instead of this shared, we'll just increment a local. Oh, uh, did I want to do? No, that's okay. I'll do it this way. Yeah, <laughs> that's an error message. This is called. It's called count. Hmm, this is nice. OK, so now there's a, a, a copy of these for something like every work group or every uh, streaming multiprocessor. It's a little vaguely defined, this local. Uh, but in any case, we're not getting values from all the different threads at the same time. So there's fewer different fewer opportunities. But um, seems like at least a couple of the plus pluses made it. So we weren't all executing within one work group or within one uh, multi let's see. Probably within one work group. We didn't actually execute all of these together. Uh, we executed most of them together and then there were a few um, that kind of came later. What if we change the work group size? <coughs> So now, within the work group at least, there's only there's one warp. Like they all, they have to run together. There's no other choice really. Um, so I guess this tells us that uh, um, this local variable is shared between more than just within the work group. Let's try it one more time. We we'll go down to work group size of one, see what comes out. 
Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, here I was changing the C code. Okay, that's more like it. All right. That makes more sense. So now, at least this work group, <coughs> it all always executes uh, together. All these elements, there's never like half of the elements in the work group execute after another half of them. They all go together or not at all. In that case, it seems like the, uh, this local belongs to uh, is per work group. OK, one more thing. You know, this doesn't actually make much sense, this code. We want to, um, we actually want to get a count. What do we do? We're going to have to use an atomic, uh, atomic increment. That goes like this. Okay, so this, um, because it's a local variable, it'll coordinate with all the other threads within the work group, and it returns the new value of the function. So here we should get an, a unique value for each um, for each element within the work group. All right, the work group is size 30, 32, so that makes sense. Let's change this to 64. And now it should go up to 63. Right? Whoa! There's something with these local variables, right? They're not quite work group related. <coughs> this, this is a local variable allocated within the streaming multiprocessor in its memory. So there's stuff going on between, um, like, the work groups are overlapping. There's like, I run one warp from this work group, another work, warp from another work group, and they're writing to the same variable. Um, gets awkward. Right. Local variables seem um, like a, an, an interesting uh, problem to deal with. Let's try one more thing. Here. Um, so if you, uh, we don't have time to do the time measurements, but it's actually all these atomic operations are blazing fast. They're not like on, a, on the Intel chip because they're, we're running so many things in parallel, it doesn't matter that we have a longer latency. It'll put all these atomic operations together and run them all in one, uh, one big chunk. There's almost no latency um, because we're hiding everything with more and more parallelism. Um, let's see how this comes out. Right. So here we can see the sort of the um, ordering uh, showing up. So within one, let's see, it was size 32, wasn't it? I think we have a work group of size 32. Yeah. So now every warp runs together, runs this increment. Right? They all add one, so that ad adds up being 32. And then we're reading it in the next step in a separate instruction. So because we did 32 increments at the same time, you'll only get values that are uh, separated by 32. Okay, so lots of funny parallelism here. Um, generally speaking, we don't want to write to shared memory in the GPU. That's why we're seeing is some, some weird effects here. I um, uh, have to be careful about synchronization and such. Um, but if we're accessing, if we're mostly just reading, and then writing to uh, a local result variable, uh, then things get less complicated. So next time we look at some performance numbers, um, try to run a few cute algorithms, and, uh, maybe try to profile something. Have a, a happy Thanksgiving, and please try to uh, get started on the homework.